going to nominate a progressive. French President Emmanuel Macron admits his country is facing a moral crisis amid violent protests over rising fuel taxes. The riots that we saw yesterday are an increasing vote of no confidence in Emmanuel Macron. He's in real trouble. Seventh overtime. I'm looking that way. Got it! The Aggies win the game of the year! I'm walking down this road of mine, this road that I go home, so am I Listen, the music has been amazing on the show this whole, what is it, four hours? Yeah, amazing. it really has. Hope you've enjoyed it as much as we have. Mm-hmm. It's only been three hours so far, though, Rachel. We have one more to go. <laughs> yeah, one Feels more. like four. No, just so kidding. So if you're on the East Coast, you should be getting up by now and getting dressed. <laughs> yeah. If you're on the West Coast, you should still you should stay in bed. And if Take you're on the West Coast, we have a Fox News alert now to tell you True. about. That is the situation on the Tijuana-San Diego border. We are aware now, according to the organizers of this caravan, that a group is going to amass and march peacefully to illegally cross at the port of entry there in Tijuana. We are aware because Griff is aware. He's done amazing reporting with the caravan from the very beginning. He's in touch with one of the top organizers just this morning who said they're amassing in the stadium. We don't know how many yet planning to march, he says peacefully, to this port of entry in San Diego at 9 o'clock Pacific time, which is noon Eastern time, just three hours from now. They say peacefully, but other passages have not been so peaceful. Uh, we don't know how many it will be, and they're, they're planning to carry banners that say, open the gates. What happens if those gates aren't open? And as we've said, this first showdown is going to have a ripple effect for the remainder of that caravan, for future caravans, for the perception of this president's policy, how strong he stood. You've got troops with new uh, capabilities backing up the Border Patrol who right. said they can't enter. There's a new arrangement we heard last night that potential that asylum seekers will not be allowed in. They have to wait in Mexico. So a lot of moving parts that could right. come to a head in just three the hours. The president making this not just an American issue at the border. He's created the, the situation so that this is now a Mexican problem as well. Here's a tweet from him. He says it would yeah, be very smart. Yeah, just just a little few minutes ago. It would be very smart if Mexico would stop the caravans long before they get to our southern border or if originating countries would not let them form. It is a way for them to get certain people out of their country and dump in U.S. no longer. Dems created this problem. No crossings. Very interesting situation. As you said, just three hours from now, we're going to see what happens. We've had Border Patrol agents um, or a director here at our at our studio or in our interviews here saying this caravan is unlike others. That's right. And we had Jason Piccolo on just a little bit earlier who has been both an ICE agent and a Border Patrol agent. Here's what he said about the caravan today. Listen. It's going to be a mess. I mean, that's one of the busiest land ports we have in the world. Right now, the caravan is filled with migrants, from what we believe. Now, if you introduce other bad actors in there, there's definitely going to be violence at the border. We need to stop this traffic before it gets to the United States. And, you know, to to his point, and as you were saying earlier, Pete, it sends a signal, right? This is the test of this caravan coming, but it's going to send a message to all the ones in the waiting as to how it's handled to say, hey, come on. Send the rest, because there's a political one we see on Facebook of this uh, organizing group, Pueblo Sin Fronteras, that they're intending to carry signs, too, that say, Abre las puertas, which means open the gates. They're making a political statement along with making an illegal act if they cross. And remember, this is all being organized by an organization called Pueblo Sin Fronteras, which means people without borders. You're right. This is a political message. And for those who don't know, there are more caravans forming and waiting to come. So, yes, this is a test, and we'll see Very what message so. it sends to those that are uh, forming and on their way right now. That's right. We had Michelle Malkin on the program earlier, and as she always does, she summed this situation up very nicely. Listen. This is a mob. It's not just a quote unquote caravan of economic migrants who are intent on sabotaging our laws to get jobs. And and what we're talking about here is a systematic and planned manipulation and abuse of our asylum system. Now, let me give some context here because I did spend 13 days in the caravan down on the Guatemala-Mexico border. They came all the way through southern Mexico to Mexico City, and now they're in Tijuana. This is one of the organizers of Pueblo Sin Fronteras telling me that they are intending to organize this group to sort of take a first step. It's not, you know, a lot of people characterize it as an invasion, and there's a lot of talk about that, whether it is or isn't, but it is at least a test 
in a group of Central Americans largely that are looking to push the political boundaries of the administration's position. We're going to see that played out and with regards to Jason Piccolo, the agent that we just played yep. the soundbite. Hopefully there is no violence, but you have to factor in that the mayor of Tijuana, Mayor Gastelum, has also said that he's not going to have it. He is refusing to allow Tijuana citizens to bear the brunt of this. So there's a lot of factors here that it is a, a very minimum, you can say, it's a very intense situation. Yeah, we have the acting deputy director who confirmed that right now there are around 6,000 migrants uh, in Tijuana, more on the way. We don't know how many of them will be attempting to go to that port of entry today. But uh, you would use the word invasion, it's been used by some. If there's a huge mass of people carrying banners or flags from their countries coming toward shielded border patrol agents, and it's not handled peacefully, that, that's that's not going to look like pretty much other than that. But not fair because of the, you know, there are a number of Central Americans who left their country because of poverty, because of crime, and they have been uh, making this march for decades. The problem now is that it was so much smaller then in some ways. Well, four months ago, we had a group of about 1,200 of a caravan that came. Only two or 300 got to this point of entry in San Ysidro to be processed. And so there's also a He's made a very clear point. The, the, the criteria for seeking asylum cannot be economic. It has to be that you are politically or religious That's incredible fear. because they know that they're, they're, there's a threat from Donald, from President Trump, they have to shut down the border. They know that they have the citizens of, of Mexico, not just in Tijuana, but so many of the towns where the caravans, caravans come say, we don't have the resources, there's an increase in crime, and yet he's a populist, um, uh, uh, oh, yeah, he's kind of a pro-immigrant populist politician. Obama, this thing is so dynamic. Yes, right, Griff, what makes a difference in my mind is that they're, and Michelle Malkin said it, it's a planned manipulation of our asylum system. They, they know if they get on our soil and say the A word, asylum, that they will they will be brought in, maybe come back for their court date as you've talked about. Yeah. So so when you know they're wanting and manipulating your law, and you know they're coming in illegally, call it what you want, it's a different situation than decades ago. And as you've covered so well, thousands and thousands of things have happened. And you know, if you talk to border patrol agents, remember, even last year, guys, I would be reporting from you from the border in Texas, right down there in the RGB, the heaviest trafficked area, and they, those agents were saying from the very beginning, it is the loopholes with Congress, it is the catch and release that is going to come to a head one day. It feels very much like you're getting closer and closer to that day. Well, that's what, that's what President Trump wants to do. He wants to end catch and release. He wants to say, listen, if you're seeking asylum, you're going to wait on the Mexican side of the border and we'll look at your case but you're not going to come to our side of the border um you go out of the general population and then we just hope you come back for your court date three years later yeah um, a lot of people didn't know that that's what was going on it's been a huge Feel to you, President Trump you know. could, could do no more. I mean, he really has mustered from the asylum to the manpower issue to uh, how he's handling and the messaging trying to send to enlist the Mexican government. There's really hard to imagine that he could uh, do more to try. I think he's doing more with this agenda. He needs partners in Congress. What's fascinating is what will soon be the Speaker Pelosi and the Democrats do to solve this? Well, probably not solve it, but this will get litigated in the 2020 election, no doubt about it. Immigration will be front and center. Uh, no matter, you know, the economy, immigration, all of that. Well, we noticed a Twitter uh, conversation or a Twitter rant by the senator from Hawaii, Ryan Schatz, uh, talking about Democrats in 2020. We've been talking about these 37 Democrats that have put their toe in the water. Will they want to run? Will they not run? Will they be moderate? Will they be progressive? Well, this senator from Hawaii kind of lays it out pretty clearly. He says what a lot of people have been thinking. He said a few thoughts on 2020. Since all my friends appear to be running, which is good. First, no one should be trying to figure this all out before the voting starts. And second, most importantly, we must reject the premise that this is a fight between moderates and progressives. We are going to nominate a progressive. He has five more tweets. You can read it for yourself. But he says what I think we've all been thinking. They're not going to, this isn't, these aren't your daddy's Democrats. They're going to nominate a progressive. Well, and the moderates in the in the Democrat conference in the on the House side have already lost. I mean, they wanted to get rid of, of, of Nancy Pelosi, mm -hmm. put somebody in who might be more um, liked in, in some of the states that they were losing, states where Trump was, was 
was uh, uh, is popular, and they've already lost. And I would say I think Alexandria Ocasio Cortez deserves a lot of credit for pushing the party into that direction. I mean, it was when she came out with that, when she won her election as a out and proud young socialist that we saw so many of these 2020 uh, potential candidates on the Democrat side come out and move to the left to mm -hmm. kind of take off their mask and say, this is who we really are. And the good news is, I think in 2020, we're going to have a real clear fight between American capitalism and socialism. And I think that's a good thing for our country to have an honest debate. Well, our viewers are already uh, emailing in. Here's Mary Catherine on Facebook saying, progressive is code word for socialist. And nowhere on that's the right. face of the earth has progressivism worked for the people. Well said. And an email from D said, rem rem reminder? Yep. Yeah, reminder that many of the Democrat Party winners in 2018 did not espouse socialist ideas. So how far they've come. Wow. And Willie on Facebook says progressive won't stand a chance in 2020. DNC needs moderate candidate that can work with both sides of the aisle. Perez still doesn't get it. Yeah, he said that uh, the socialists from the Bronx were the future of the party. She I mean, did they, say that. They've bowed to that. They've bowed to open borders. They've bowed to abolish ICE. They've bowed to Medicare for all, free college tuition, give away, give away, give away. They're not going to pull back from that now. If anything, they're going to be forced to polarize on it, to run to the left to win the nomination. And then there's Trump on the other side. We'll see. You know, we really just saw in Florida where I was covering the recount for you guys, uh, Senator Bill Nelson. You know, he was a centrist uh, Democrat center for many years. Gone. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. It's the future, the socialism on the side of the Democrat Party. So that's that's where the momentum is. Well, we're going to turn now to your headlines. A suspected illegal immigrant charged in a deadly hit and run Thanksgiving morning was out of jail on bond at the time of the crash. Police arrested Joel Velasquez. Her political influence through that foundation. Here to explain, former assistant U.S. attorney and Fox News contributor Andy McCarthy. Good morning, Andy. What do you say about all Good morning. this? Well, you know, I, I think, Griff, that there was a, a big miss during the email scandal because there was a lot of chatter, uh, mainly driven by President Clinton, but also the Justice Department, and the FBI, about whether Mrs. Clinton intended to harm the United States by setting up this private email communication system and destroying all these emails. And the thing is, not only was that not part of the case against her, not only was that not part of the classified information statute under which she was being investigated, it obscured what the real reason, I think, was mm. for the fact that she set up this private system and destroyed all these emails, which is that during her tenure, the State Department was put in the service of the Clinton Foundation, which was a scheme to monetize her political influence. And that's what the lost evidence is about. And, and that would explain why she took a hammer and a bleach bit. And she was so intent on making sure that this information never got out because it would not just take her down. It could take yep. down Chelsea and, and possibly her husband as well. Yeah, Rachel, think about this. There's a lot of government people we're learning more and more uh, who end up conducting some of their official duties on their private email. Sometimes it's just because of the necessity of a, of a moment in time when, you know, you only have your private email with you and you have to respond to something. And most of that stuff is OK as long as it gets as long as a copy of the e emails makes it into the file. But this isn't a si situation where she even constantly conducted her business on private email. She set up a system in which to do it. Mm -hmm. She actually mm -hmm. set up a system that was a, a totally private framework that was run out of the Clinton family home in New York, which, you know, is the headquarters of the Clinton family foundation. What a surprise. What a surprise. Andy, uh, you know, a lot of people will, you hear more about this. We've heard a lot about it. Will the Clintons ever be held to account for influence peddling? Hard to say. Um, you know, in some ways, Pete, if you look at it as a kind of a political society rather than a, than a rule of law society, which I tend to look at it as, she has been held to account because I think cumulatively all of this cost her what everybody mm -hmm. thought was a shoe-in election to the White House. So in some ways the public has had its say, but you do hope at some point the legal system will have its say. Now, I, I would point out the Supreme Court has made it much harder to do political corruption cases uh, by some decisions that it's made in the last few years. Mm. So it, it's a tough proof. But, but you, you know, the Republicans are talking about having a hearing on this before they mm. cede control of the House. 
to, uh, to, to the Democrats, I think that would be a really good thing. It's a good point about the election, though. Andy McCarthy, thank you very much. Thanks, for Andy. Time. Thank you, Andy. Thanks, Pete. You Thanks, guys. Have a good one. All right, well, U.S. troops standing guard at the border as thousands of migrants are waiting to cross. General Anthony Tata says the president... Senator Hyde-Smith, who has a very important election on Tuesday, she is an outstanding person who is strong on the border, crime, military, our great vets, health care, and the Second Amendment needed in D.C. The Republican incumbent is facing Democrat opponent Mike Espy in a runoff election. And on Wednesday, House Democrats will cast their initial votes for Speaker. Nancy Pelosi is looking to regain the title, but on Friday, nine Democrats said they would not vote for Pelosi unless she changed some House rules. We'll see what happens. Pete, Rachel. Thanks, Griff. Well, as the migrant caravan closes in on the U.S. border, they're right there. Our next guest says President Trump was right to send troops to the border and points out how presidents of both parties have done it before. Joining us now is former Deputy Commanding General of the U.S. Forces in Afghanistan and author of Dark Winter, retired Brigadier General Anthony Data. Welcome. Great to be with you, Rachel. Pete. Morning. Thank you. So there's a lot of consternation on the left. They're very, almost freaking out that we're sending the troops to the border. Um, why are they so upset about it? It's, it, it? it's not unprecedented. And are they just worried that maybe it'll work? Well, the left has uh, an immediate visceral reaction uh, in the opposite direction to anything President Trump does for a lot of different reasons. One is that uh, President Trump is uh, a man of his word, and he said he was going to be tough on the border, and he is tough on the border. Secondly, he's undoing uh, President Obama's legacy. And third, he's fighting the globalists uh, tooth and nail uh, by espousing patriotism and nationalism, as he should, as we should all uh, do uh, within this great country. You know, JTF-6, JTF North is uh, the name of the task force that has been on the border since George H.W. Bush put it there. President Obama, President Clinton uh, operated with uh, JTF-6 and JTF North on the border. So uh, what liberals today don't understand the history, what President Trump has done is rightfully reinforce the border in the face of an mm -hmm. unprecedented threat with thousands of migrants coming. And, and we all know that there's uh, drugs and, and possible terrorists in that uh, um, caravan coming at to the border and yeah. and and this is very Pete, this is very classic trump uh what you know the big show is that the military is there doing their duty uh counter mobility operations intelligence reconnaissance meanwhile he's got secretary of state working a diplomatic deal and it's that those levers of uh power national power that president trump is so good at yeah uh, he he's got military on the border meanwhile he's negotiating a deal and all of a sudden uh you know they've got a wait in mexico now now, yeah, uh, and and to apply for asylum. Well, it takes a hard power to get that breakthrough in diplomacy. Oftentimes, General, other presidents have done it. There is precedent, but none have sent this many uh, and, and loosened up some of the uh, the restrictions on what they can do to support the mission. And and other administrations haven't gotten the job done. I mean, whatever was done wasn't right. enough to stop the flow. So, are the troops being sent there enough to actually address the issue? Yeah, no, that's a great point, Pete. Uh, this this is an unprecedented move. My point previously was just, you know, liberals react, um, but they don't know that the, the, you know, the previous Democrat presidents had had troops on the border also. This is an unprecedented move. It's the right move that President Trump has done. And, and uh, he can keep these troops on the border as long as necessary until that threat subsides. And with this diplomatic deal, I think the threat will subside a little bit uh, with the incoming uh, uh, administration in Mexico, mm -hmm. and and this is really uh, groundbreaking, uh, a brand new type of deal. If Mexico holds uh, the immigrants, uh, the migrants at the border, or uh, you know further inland from the border, then I think that's uh, that will be a huge deterrence yeah. to people thinking that they're going to be able to step one foot in the country right. and then caught and released. It's a great point. Well, you talked about globalism. One of the chief proponents of globalism <laughs> right. in Europe is German Chancellor. Chancellor Angela Merkel. She gave a speech earlier this week where she talked, she said states got to be willing to give up their sovereignty. Listen to what uh, she had to say. She said, in this day, nation states must today, should today, I say, be ready to give up sovereignty. But of course, in an orderly procedure, either you are one of those who believe they can solve everything on their own and ha only have to think about themselves. That is nationalism in the purest form. This is not patriotism. A clear swipe 
at, at uh, President Trump and his emphasis on patriotism and nationalism, giving up your sovereignty in an orderly fashion. Why does that sound like a good idea to someone like her? <laughs> well, it sounds a lot like Germany about 80 years ago, but uh, the the uh, Merkel has clearly uh, lost her her way because uh, what what she a she's uh, now she's not running for re-election and b um, they with President Trump forcing NATO and the European Union to pay its fair share, all of these European nations are realizing that their free ride is over. And so they are scraping and clawing. Macron, Merkel, and all of them are trying to find a way to get other people to pay for their for existence because they can't afford to have their socialist policies um, and and, and uh, rely on the, the United States anymore because they can't because President Trump is forcing their hand on this and it's very interesting to watch all these European leaders either break uh, like Brexit or or go the way that Merkel's talking and, and Macron and and as they think about the future of Europe, uh, that it's going in one of two directions, toward the Merkel's direction of socialism and, and this borderless globalism, or the way the UK and others are going, where they are identifying with their nation and holding fast. And, and it's fascinating to watch from a collective security standpoint. It Absolutely. is. We're seeing protests in France. We're seeing a lot of uh, uh, the, the real people starting to have their voices um, heard and, and reacting to what the elites want. So thank you so General, much thank for you very much us. for your time. Thank we appreciate you. it. All right, coming up next, Trish Regan joins us to talk about the impact of falling oil prices. The president tweeted about it this morning as well and the impact on your wallet. Plus a dog's incredible journey, how he ended up 1,200 miles away from home. Meet me halfway. Let me tell you who we're going to meet all the way. And that is Trish Regan joining us this morning. Good morning. Thank you guys. Thank you. A good Thanksgiving, right? Yes. I trust. How was yours? Fantastic. Yeah. It was fantastic. Yeah, I had my whole family here and my sister and her fiance and the kids and my husband, James, my fun. parents. It was lots of fun. We had a lot of turkey. You were hosting. Was it yes. stressful? It was stre not stressful. Oh. It was fun. <laughs> well, let me just say, uh, <clears throat> there's such a thing as the grocery door, the grocery delivery service. So uh, oh, I got my smart. order in smart in time this woman. year. <laughs> smart. Yeah, yeah. All right. Now we got to. Uh, President Trump tweeted about 48 minutes ago. About 48 minutes ago. 48 minutes ago. Uh, this tweet. He said, "So great that oil prices are falling. Thank you, President T. <laughs> Add that, which is like a big tax cut to our other good economic news. Inflation down." Are you listening, Fed? So <laughs> he feels like the oil prices coming down are like an like an additional tax cut to the economy. Yeah, you know, I, I like the part. Are you listening, Fed? Uh, he's <laughs> needling Jay Powell there again because the Federal Reserve has been talking about raising interest rates, something that the president does not think that we need. Now, uh, lower oil prices are like a tax cut, right? Because, you know, you spend less money at the gas pump. It's like you got more found money right there in your pocket. Yeah. And so those yeah. those go a long way towards giving a sort of immediate boost, if you would, to the economy and certainly to consumer spending. You know, you mentioned the Fed there. Were you surprised this past week when the housing entities really got behind the president pushing on Powell about about not raising these rates. Well, I think housing entities, they don't want to see rising rates either, right? Because if yeah. rates go up, well, then mortgages go up, and that means the housing market has a harder time. And so, you know, look, I think it, it, in a normal environment, if you have enough inflation, right? And by the way, that's all the Fed's supposed to be watching for right now is inflation. Mm -hmm. If you have that inflation, you need to react. Um, but when you look at what's going on, we still do not have enough of it. We got a little inflation. You got wages now growing close to 3%, but that's not a lot really in the scheme of things. And so is it enough for the Fed to move right now? That's the question. I don't think you have enough inflation. Mm -hmm. I hope we get more and more of it down the road, but for the Fed to be so cautionary, this is what he's concerned about. And he's basically saying like, look, you know, you don't need to do this. Mm -hmm. So Trish, you say that we need to look to Wall Street for even better deals this holiday season. What do you mean by that? Uh, better deals this holiday. Oh, in terms of uh, retail shop, yeah, what's the you, you get your shopping list yeah, going. Fine, fine, fine. <laughs> well, how's You're it looking so me. far? We had Black Friday. We got Cyber Monday yeah. coming up. I mean, what's yeah. the consumer sentiment here? As we go I think consumers feel really good. I think they feel really, really. I mean, I know that the market can be 
kind of rocky. Um, but if you divorce what's going on fundamentally in our economy and you just look at, you know, the strength of GDP numbers, the overall economic growth, if you look at the increase, we're seeing slight increase in wages. If you look at consumer sentiment and consumer confidence, people feel good. Yeah. And that means a whole lot. One of the things that this president does really well uh, is he gets out in front of this and sort of very much like a, like a coach, right, on the right. sidelines is going rah, rah, rah. He is very optimistic. Well, uh, on on America. The yeah, yeah. And, and that matters. I mean, I can remember all the times that President Obama, mm -hmm. you know, we'd see a good jobs report, but you'd never know it if you listen to him because he'd tell you, well, we still got a long ways to go. We got a long ways to go. We always have a long ways to go. But it's wonderful to see a president that's talking up what's going on in our economy that's actually strong. Well, he and almost good. has to talk it up because if he does it, no that's one else true. is going to. <laughs> I know, you listen to the mainstream media, right? Like yeah. they, they don't you ever want to tell you it. when there's good news. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, so, it's so you've encouraged comical. my wife and teenage daughters to continue their shopping spree <laughs> with this confidence talk. Thank you, Trish. What else are you going to talk about today on Sunday morning? Oh, we got a lot going on. We're going to talk about the border situation, of course, of course. Um, which is ongoing. And, uh, you know, Mexico allegedly had promised uh, to to house a lot of these people as they're waiting for asylum there mm -hmm. on the border to Tijuana. Um, it, it looks as though some of that's in doubt. So where are we heading as we still continue to watch thousands, right? So you it, have Representative Mike Johnson ways. on yes. the show, chairman of the GOP study committee. Um, which is the largest caucus of conservatives in Congress. Who else do you have on the show today? Oh, We have Representative Jim Himes, so we'll get the Democrats' take on it as well. Alan Dershowitz is going to be there, a Harvard Law professor. You know him well. Mm -hmm. We'll have to talk with him a little bit about the Mueller situation and, of course, uh, the Roger That's Stone still going associate. On? Can you imagine? I didn't even realize it. Yeah, <laughs> no, it's still it's going on. Still it's going really on. Trish, thank you. We look forward to watching. Oh, turn yeah. off the channel. Yeah, don't do it. Wait for Trish. <laughs> All right. <laughs> We're going to turn now to some of our headlines. Two big time Democrats are rolling out their basic income plans, but one think tank says both plans would add another cost. Senator Kamala Harris and Cory Booker are proposing separate plans to give money to low income families to give them some financial relief. But a Heritage Foundation writer says plans like these tend to fail because they remove the incentive to work. And elections violation complaint against Kid Rock has been dismissed. A watchdog group filed a complaint after the musician appeared to take some steps towards running for U.S. Senate. The, general, the Federal Elections Commission ruled his self-promotion was an artistic undertaking tied to his upcoming music tour and not a campaign violation. Hmm. Animal rights group PETA is asking a town named Wool to change its name to Vegan Wool. The goal is to promote veganism and fight cruelty. City council members in the English village are calling the request ridiculous, but they will discuss it next month anyway. Um, PETA is offering every household in wool a vegan-friendly blanket if they agree to change the name. I don't know if they want that. I still love it, dog. A family dog missing for more than a year found more than 1,000 miles away from home. The pup from New York named Sinatra, of course, turned up in a neighborhood near Tampa, Florida. It's unclear how the blue-eyed husky ended up so far from home. Sinatra is expected to be reunited with his owners today. I'm sure we'll bring you that video footage at some point on Fox News. And now we've got a to toss to Rick. Rick, hey, where are you? I'm outside. Hey, Rick. He's a Julie, voice. come here. There we you, go. What's going on with your family here? Well, what's, we are what's... enjoying New York, and one of us <laughs> is a little nervous. <laughs> is that was it nervous? I think you know, Wait, if you, shy. if you, oh no, now I feel really bad. I think <laughs> I just. A little shy. Uh, oh, a no. little okay, shy. hey, it's going to be all right. It's going to be all right. Come We're going to get way. you something good to make up for what I just did to you. I'm so sorry. Take a look at the weather map. Show you what's going on this morning. It is cold across the plains. And that's because we have a big storm that's brewing uh, down across the southeast. Be very careful for some very uh, thick fog this morning. We'll see that also across parts of the Ohio Valley. Big storm moved across the mid-Atlantic and northeast overnight. Now beginning to exit, mostly just impacting Maine for the remainder of the day. This is our big storm across the central plains. It's uh, becoming quite powerful and very windy along with it. And because of that, we have blizzard warnings in effect anywhere you see that red, where you see that pink, that is winter storm warnings. We're going to see some spots up to about a foot of snow, kind of a line from about Kansas City just to the north of Chicago. So get ready for uh, your first big snow event of the year. And I hope he'll forgive me. Will he forgive me? Yes, yes, he will. Okay, all right. So that, hey, we honey, love you. All right, love good. You. Thanks for coming. <laughs> Guys, back to you inside. All right. <laughs> well done, Rick. Thanks, Rick. Appreciate it.
All right, a Fox News alert. The European Union agreeing to a Brexit deal with Britain. We're live with what happens next. And from mini trees to Christmas pineapples, we are decking the halls with the hottest Christmas tree trend, so we're told. Pineapples? Wow, pineapple. I'll explain. Maybe. <laughs>